Now, my topic this evening is uh, called uh, Contemporary Liberal Discourse and Jihadism, Why the Disconnect? And perhaps that should have read Why the Connect? Um, because it's both disconnect in one sense and connect in another. So uh, we all uh, need, I'm sure, no reminding about the events of the last summer, uh, the terrible events in Paris, uh, the attack on the uh, satirical magazine uh, Charlie Hebdo and the murder of the cartoonists for the crime of having depicted uh, Mohammed uh, in scatological and other irreverent terms. So after uh, Charlie Hebdo, uh, we had also the, um, uh, the uh, atrocity in uh, Copenhagen. The, the Copenhagen meeting that was attacked was called to discuss the threat to freedom of speech um, that uh, the Islamic world uh, was posing through radical Islamic terrorism. Now, Charlie Hebdo and Copenhagen were said to be about freedom of speech. Uh, but this clearly wasn't the case. It, these were not attacks whose main purpose was to snuff out freedom of speech. It, their main purpose was to snuff out human life. And we saw that very graphically illustrated when on both occasions, in the Paris uh, and the Copenhagen atrocities, uh, very uh, quickly after those attacks on Charlie Hebdo and the freedom of speech meeting in Copenhagen, there were attacks on Jews in Paris, the attacks on the kosher grocery store and the school, and in Copenhagen, the attack on the synagogue. Now, people were very reluctant to say this was anything other than freedom of speech, and they were confused uh, when there were these attacks on Jews because it didn't fit the template. They could just about accept that it was an attack on freedom of speech. They couldn't accept that there was a problem when it came to Jews. And they couldn't accept it because it didn't fit the template. Why didn't it fit the template? Because there is and was and is a great reluctance to identify correctly that this threat of radical Islamism stems from religious fanaticism, from a particular interpretation of Islam. Now, for sure, that doesn't mean that all Muslims subscribe to this interpretation of Islam. There are many Muslims who will have nothing to do with it, nothing to do with this kind of extremism, nothing to do with this theological interpretation, and nothing to do with the violence that flows from it. And indeed, uh, Muslims are the most numerous victims around the world of this particular form of terrorism. However, it is ridiculous to pretend that it does not have the roots that it does in the religious sources of Islam when there are so many quite disparate groups emerging out of widely different conflict zones all around the world, all exhibiting very similar behavior and all justifying their forms of barbarism by specifically by verses from the Islamic holy texts. Despite this, however, we see politicians throughout the West going to enormous lengths to say that Islamic terror has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, Monsieur Hollande said it after the Paris massacres. He said this has got nothing to do with Islam. Uh, when Islamic State started beheading uh, Western hostages and, de and disseminating those appalling videos, the British Prime Minister David Cameron said Islamic State can have nothing to do with Islam because no religion in the world could ever tolerate or condone such barbarism. And President Obama says it regularly after every massacre that takes place in the name of Islam. It has nothing to do with Islam. It is un-Islamic and all the rest. So not only does the West not identify this threat correctly, but it actually goes further in responding, very frequently responding to such terrorist outrages or intimidation by blaming the victim. So after the Charlie Hebdo slaughter, it was said to be the cartoonist's fault that they had chosen deliberately to draw cartoons which insulted Muhammad. And any criticism of Islam or Islamic terror or Islamic misdeeds or misdeeds by Muslims is said to be Islamophobia. The more terrible the misdeeds, uh, the more people are upset and worried and anxious and express those anxieties about the Islamic religion, Islamic culture, the more they are said to be Islamophobic. So last summer, during the Gaza war, we saw this perversity expressed. We saw repeatedly expressed on the streets of Britain and elsewhere in Europe 
this extraordinary alliance of left-wingers and liberals committed to gay rights, equality for women and freedom of speech, marching shoulder to shoulder with Muslims committed to the execution of gays, the stoning of women, and the suppression of speech. Now, how can this be? Well, what unites the British progressive with the Muslim theocrat who is stuck in the seventh century is their shared hatred of the state of Israel. And that hatred, that shared hatred of the state of Israel, goes with being a Western progressive, apparently, because, as we all know, being anti-Israel or anti-Zionist has got absolutely nothing to do with being anti-Jew. And we know that, don't we, because there are plenty of Jews who are anti-Israel or anti-Zionist, and they can't be anti-Jew, can they? So people who think like all that, who deny what Islamic terrorism is about, guess what, it's about Islam, or an interpretation of Islam, and who deny that anti-Zionism or anti-Israelism has anything to do with being anti-Jew, had the most appalling shock as a result of last summer's Gaza war, when utterly unambiguous anti-Jew stuff surfaced in Britain with shouts on the streets during the demonstrations against Israel, shouts on the streets of Hitler should have finished the job, the near barring of something called the Jewish Film Festival by the Tricycle Theatre, a fashionable fringe theatre, which had hosted the Jewish Film Festival uh, for many years. Uh, it tried or it almost did succeed in barring the Jewish Film Festival from its premises on account of a very small Israel embassy donation to the Jewish Film Festival. And there was also the trashing of supermarkets' kosher produce. It was a wonderful ruse by Muslim anti-Israel demonstrators to go into uh, standard grocery stores called Sainsbury's or Tesco's, big chains in Britain, go to the kosher uh, food section, the chilled cabinets or the freezer cabinets stocking kosher produce, take it all off the shelves or out of the freezers, put it in the wire trolleys, in the wire carts, and as a result, that produce was trashed because through hygiene rules it couldn't be put back into the chillers or kosher or, 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 or freezer compartments. And thus this was a wonderful way of reacting to uh, their beef with Israel, taking out their complaint about Israel by trashing kosher food. And everybody went, what? But this is Jewish food. It's got nothing to do with Israel. How come these demonstrators are making the connection. So they all had a terrible shock. And they all said, how can this be happening in Britain? All these British liberals, all these British leftists who denied the roots of Muslim uh, radicalism, Muslim extremism, who deny that anti-Israel stuff had anything to do with anti-Jew stuff. They said, how can this be happening in Britain? Britain, that is turning its people, its Muslims are turning against Jews. How can this be in a society where multiculturalism and anti-racism are now imprinted on our DNA? We are the most tolerant, the kindest, the gentlest, the most inclusive country in the most inclusive uh, uh, period in the country's history. How can this be happening in Britain? Britain, which has by common consent now moved to the left, or so we're told, and as a result of moving to the left, is a kinder, gentler, more tolerant society. Britain, which has legislated against hate speech, which is inclusive to a fault, and is the most slavish exponent of human rights in the world. Britain has turned left. It's a kinder and gentler nation. How can it possibly be playing host to this appalling attacks, these appalling attacks on Jews as Jews? And why are we being attacked by homegrown Muslims who have become radical and who are trying to kill us? Well, the answer, in my view, is that it is precisely the ideologies that the left takes such pride in, ideologies like multiculturalism and anti-racism, which have actually turned into the prompts for hatred and for bigotry and for prejudice. The very things that they're supposed to be against, they've turned, in my view, into the uh, prompts for those very things. Now, I believe this upside-down way of thinking is part of a much wider and deeper confusion 
that's attacked our culture in the West from within and made it particularly vulnerable to attack from without. And uh, this is particularly pronounced in Britain. Uh, it's not so pronounced here for reasons that we can possibly discuss, but I can see that it's encroaching even here too. I believe that uh, this upside down way of thinking is rooted ultimately well, I'll say ultimately you can go back many centuries, but I believe that where I would put the starting point is the fall of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I would suggest the fall of communism, which actually took place before the fall of the Berlin Wall. I mean, communism was imploding well before that in a kind of cultural sense. The fall of communism helped promote, I think, quite seismic changes to cultural attitudes in the West. With the fall of communism, the political right found it had no more dragon to slay. It was dead. Communism was over. As far as the left was concerned, it had no more socialist charger to ride. It had no cause anymore behind which it could march. So the left needed a new utopian project, a project that was all about the perfection of the world, which is what communism purported to be, the left needed a new utopian project that would enable it to continue its defining mission to transform society and human nature. And it alighted upon a project which was something which had started in the 1960s among the famous baby boomers, but was now being given extra impetus by the fall of communism. And this was a culture war in which revolutionary zeal shifted its uh, focus from politics and economics, where it had been uh, preoccupied by politics and economics during uh, the communist uh, period. It transferred this revolutionary zeal from politics and economics to attacking the very building blocks, the cultural building blocks of the West. Now, this attack was, I think, rooted in an onslaught against biblical morality, the moral codes that basically say we put the interests of others above ourselves, that's how we build a community, that's how we build a society, and instead it put the interests of us, me, myself, my subjective opinion, at the very centre of the universe. So it was rooted in an onslaught against biblical moral codes, and it set out on what was called a march through the institutions, systematically undermining these core institutions one by one, the traditional family, education, national identity. And it took the form of ideologies or isms. Uh, these moral codes which had underpinned the West for all those centuries were replaced by man-made ideas called ideologies. Now, an ideology is basically, I would suggest, the doctrine of an idea. It is, the, uh, it is a creed which builds an idea into a kind of unchallengeable force. It's uh, a dogma, in other words, and it turned into the very dogmatic intolerance that the Western liberal was supposed to be against. So I want to come on to this business of ideologies in a moment, but first I will just give you a bit of an anecdote uh, to give you an idea of how the pursuit of ideology turned what was supposed to be progressive-ism into its opposite. For about two, for the, the best part of two decades, I worked for The Guardian, which, as you may know, is a newspaper which is the great voice, the great crucible, the great centre of Britain's intellectual left. Um, I didn't actually regard myself as a left wing. I regarded myself as what we call in Britain a liberal. I know in America you think that the two things are the same. You call the two, two things the same. But in Britain, uh, there's a big broad distinction between uh, classical liberals and the left. Classical liberals is what I thought I was, and I still think I am. Uh, classical liberal believes basically in the capacity of human beings to create a better world. You, you encourage people to behave well. You discourage them from behaving badly. You stand up for the vulnerable and dispossessed. You stand up against abuses of power. That's a classical liberal, and that's what I was, and that's what I regard myself st as still, uh, st still being. And at the time, I thought that The Guardian and I uh, were marching under the same banner, and I came to realise that that wasn't the case. In 1982, that belief started to fracture, as it happens around the issue of Israel. Now, at that time, I had never spoken or written about Israel. I'd never 
been there and never even wanted to go there. And that's a, another story we, we might talk about. I supported it as a refuge for Jews who were persecuted, but that had nothing to do with me because I was a British Jew living in Britain, which was the most civilized country on earth, working for the most civilized paper in the most civilized country on earth, and working among some of the most civilized people on the most civilized paper in the most civilized country on earth. Nevertheless, I became very, very concerned in 1982 about what seemed to be a vendetta among these civilized people who were just like me, a vendetta against Israel, a country I'd never been to and never wanted to go to. But it seemed to me unfair and extraordinary and remarkable that, for example, when, Basha, when, when, when Assad, the father, uh, was killing uh, between, well, depending on which reports you you uh, took notice of between 15 and 40,000 people uh, in Syria over the course of a few days, to sa change, um, the Guardian devoted very little space to that, and instead, uh, every time Israel, which at, the, at that time was embroiled in uh, what was considered to be a controversial, if not disastrous, war in the Lebanon, every time Israel killed any Palestinians at all, there was a front page splash story, there were outraged editorials, there were furious op-eds, and I said to, uh, to I, 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 I wondered, I wondered why, why this was. Now the Guardian, uh, we're talking about the left here. We're talking about the left and its and its and its attitudes. The Guardian had once been a passionate supporter of Israel in 1947, 48, uh, when many British Jews were very ambivalent about Israel. The Guardian, as it was then called, the Manchester Guardian, Manchester being quite a civilized country, uh, quite a quite a civilized city. Um, it, the Guardian went wrong when it moved to London. That's another story. Um, uh, the Guardian was a passionate supporter of Israel, and but by, by the time I got to it in the late very late 70s, early 80s, it was very hostile. Not as hostile as it now is, but it was very hostile. And along with the rest of the left, the Guardian's attitude had begun to change in, I suspect, the 1970s, around the time that the Palestinian leadership under Yasser Arafat, who was working in cahoots with the Soviet Union, uh, adopted this brilliant strategy, brilliant, brilliant strategy of psychological warfare in which between the two of them, Arafat and the Soviet Union, they rewrote history to transform the Israelis in the eyes of the left from socialist pioneers, picking oranges, wearing shorts, being the kind of people that would read The Guardian, uh, to colonialist aggressors. Just complete change. And the Palestinians were changed in this rewriting of history from genocidal aggressors into aboriginal victims. Well, as I say, I began to notice that the coverage of Israel and the Guardian was disproportionate, distorted, and quite viciously hostile. It was presenting Israel falsely as the bully in the region while ignoring or downplaying its victimization by the Arab world. So one day in an editorial meeting, I asked why there seemed to be a double standard in the paper and why was there minimal coverage of Arab atrocities against other Arabs while acres of space were devoted to attacking Israel for what was controversial or not. It was basically defending itself against attack. And my colleagues stunned me. They said, of course there's a double standard. What do you expect? Uh, how could there not be a double standard? After all, they said to me, uh, the third world doesn't have the same beliefs as we do about the value of life. They're not brought up to believe in the sanctity of life and equality of human beings. That's what we believe in the West. And we can't judge them by our standards. That would be racism. Huh. And I, it's, I mean, you laugh. This was the first time I'd come up against this madness. And I was very taken aback. The Guardian was the shrine of anti-racism. And I said, how can it be racism? Are you actually saying that if someone's unfortunate enough to be born into the third world, they're not entitled to expect the same rights to life and liberty as we are? And they said, well, you're looking at it the wrong way around. And why are you getting so upset? After all, we do you, and this is where I became you rather than we, we do you the great honor in Israel, and I've never been to Israel, of believing that you stand for the same things that we do. And we so we judge you by our standards. And what's more, you tell us that you're morally superior to us. And so we are entitled to judge you by higher standards. Now, this was very shocking to me uh, because uh, as far as I was concerned, this was pure racism. It was also anti-Jewish. And uh, what they were saying about Jews as prejudiced and spiteful 
they were saying that the third world wasn't entitled to life and liberty as, as we were. This was pure racism. And I'd also be made to feel for the first time as if I were suddenly regarded as no longer one of them, but something different, a Jew, just because I had questioned the double standard over Israel as a matter of truth and logic and justice. But how could this be, I asked myself. This was the Guardian, the shrine of anti-racism, the custodian of social conscience, the embodiment of virtue. How couldn't they see that they were actually making common cause with people who were everything that they were supposed to be against? How could they be so impervious to factual evidence about the Middle East, to evidence of history, to evidence of what was going on at that very moment? And how could they be so bigoted against Jews, now being openly accused at that time by fashionable, and, and much worse now, uh, uh, how much worse it, it is now, openly accused Israel is by the most fashionable thinkers and writers and playwrights and actors and human rights activists and left-wing politicians, openly accused of manipulating Western foreign policy, the foreign policy of America, for their own advantage, putting the rest of the world at risk, and even, scroll on to last summer, deliberately and inhumanly killing children. How could the left, uh, acme of reason, of anti-racism, of factual analysis, of fairness, how could they be engaging in such terrible calumnies as to invent this cosmic prejudice, this, 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 uh, this impression of a cosmic evil against the Jewish people? Couldn't they hear the resonances with the anti-Jewish blood libels down through the centuries? Well, the left are always utterly outraged at any suggestion they may harbour any prejudice at all against Jews. Uh, they cannot be prejudiced. How can they be prejudiced? They represent virtue. They are anti-racist. Everybody who's not the left is a racist. How can they be racist? Everyone who's on the right is anti-Semitic, not them. Opposing anti-Semitism, which is equivalent, which is equated in their minds with the right, or the far right, or fascism, opposing fascist anti-Semitism is their moral high ground. And yet, among the left, anti-Semitism in Britain um, has been for years the prejudice that dare not speak its name. Any suggestion that the animus against Israel is fundamentally anti-Jew provokes the most hysterical denunciation. The suggestion that uh, was made uh, twice in the last few months by the former uh, Labour Foreign Secretary Jack Straw that unlimited Jewish money controls American foreign policy in the Middle East. He was the former British Foreign Secretary. He made that remark twice and it passed without comment. Nobody turned a hair. The grotesque anti-Jewish libels and calumnies that pour out of the Palestinian Authority, forget the Hamas, they pour out of the Palestinian Authority and the wider Muslim world daily, is never reported at all in Britain, and I suspect it's not reported here either. And that is because in Britain, anti-Semitism is seen only as a historic crime and one confined to one set of people only, the far right. Only if you are a right-winger can you be anti-Jew. If you are a left-winger, by definition, you cannot be anti-Jew because if you are a left-winger, you stand for virtue and moral progress. So to the left, anti-Semitism can only occur on the far right and never in progressive circles, as I've just said, but also never in ethnic minority circles because ethnic minorities, as victims of the West, can never do wrong. So, bearing all this in mind, I really did grind my teeth over the platitudes and the reverential, soupy, syrupy, reverential tone adopted by the BBC when dealing with the recent 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Uh, it lowered its voice collectively and spoke in hushed and reverential ways about the victims of Auschwitz, but the BBC has never reported the lynching of the Jews of France over the past two decades or so. It never reports the deranged Jew hatred in the Hamas Charter or that pours out of the Palestinian Authority with which they indoctrinate their children to hate and to murder Jews. It has never 
reported the ravings against the Jews by the Iranian Ayatollahs. Instead, it tells us that Iran is now governed by moderates. And whenever Jews raise any of these things, we are told that we are waving the shroud of the Holocaust to sanitize the crimes of Israel. At the same time, some of the very worst Israel bashers on the left dwell reverently on the victims of the Shoah and boast, if they're of a certain age, of their own record in standing up against the neo-Nazis of Britain and Europe. It is they who wrap themselves in the shroud of the Holocaust to camouflage their own vilification and double standards uh, adopted towards today's Israeli victims of anti-Jewish bigotry. In my view, anti-Israel attitudes undoubtedly serve as a cover for anti-Semitism. The anti-Israel animus has exactly the same characteristics, the unique characteristics, of uh, Jew hatred down through the centuries. Uh, the particular images of medieval and Nazi anti-Jewish bigotry, to put it to, to just, 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 for, just for starters, then the demonization based on the most grotesque falsehoods, the hysterical imputation of a malevolent hidden force manipulating the world to its disadvantage, and the obsessive nature of that demonization. These are all characteristics which one finds in both classic anti-Jew hatred and in anti-Israel hatred uh, today. Uh, a Guardian editorial marking the Auschwitz anniversary illustrated the vicious moral equivocations on the left between dead Jews, living Israelis, and Muslim anti-Semites, claiming that the Holocaust was, quote, never entirely absent from our minds, thank you, Guardian, and stating that it should never be allowed to happen again, we're so grateful. It then took a swipe at the unnamed leaders of Israel who have been ready to exploit its vulnerability. Ready to exploit its vulnerability. Hmm. Exaggerating the threat from Iran, no doubt, was what they had in mind. And although the Guardian graciously conceded that, quote, a people who came close to extinction cannot be blamed for not wanting to put their fate ever again in other hands, it nevertheless equated the Jews of Europe who were this is of, as, of, as of a few months ago, the Jews of Europe who were, quote, gripped by a new insecurity, it acknowledged what the Jews of Europe were going through, how could it not, with the French Jews leaving in their thousands, a new insecurity, it equated that with Muslims who suffered, quote, the slow swell of hostility in the wake of jihadist outrages like the massacre at Charlie Hebdo. Get your heads around that. That is what you get from higher education in Britain and working for the Guardian newspaper. Such false moral equivalence obscures the threat to European Jews from European Muslims. And indeed, it omitted to mention altogether in this particular editorial the slaughter in the Paris grocery store when it was talking about Charlie Hebdo. So absent-minded, these Guardian editorial writers. Now, much of all this is because the left has changed. In the past, I'm really talking about Britain, but I think this is probably generally true too. In the past, uh, uh, being on the left uh, was said famously to owe more to Methodism than to Marx. That is to say, uh, being on the left meant that you believed in something beyond the here and now. You believed, basically, that ultimate redemption would come in heaven. Uh, politics was indeed about improving the lot of man on earth, but ultimate perfection was in the province of the Almighty. Since then, thanks to the weakness of the Church of England, particularly obviously in Britain, secularism has just knocked out religion in Britain. Uh, Britain is in the forefront of the collapse of religion. You don't have the same situation here. You have the red states, which I know uh, are uh, favorite, uh, fa favorite states for so many people. But nevertheless, you have the red states with the evangelical Christians. And they're sort of, this is the great sort of bedrock of the country is still biblically faithful, very different from Britain, which is really a post-religious uh, society. 
In Britain, God has been replaced by man-made ideas, and these are the ideologies I was talking about, the isms, ideas made by man such as materialism, anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism, utilitarianism, feminism, multiculturalism, environmentalism. We can all think of other isms, I'm sure. Now, all these isms are very different, but they have certain things in common. What they fundamentally have in common is the Marxist aim of overturning the established order in the West. They replaced faith in God by the worship of the ideas of man, and it was man who would create the perfect society here on Earth, and all these ideologies and isms are ways of achieving that perfect society. But instead of achieving a perfect society, which of course is impossible, utopia is impossible, and people who pursue utopia, I'm afraid, always resort to tyranny and worse, because they cannot achieve what they want to achieve, and they turn on the people who they think are impeding utopia as scapegoats. The Jews have always been in the forefront of that terrible process. So instead of achieving utopia, what all these ideologies did, in my view, was to saw off progressively, to saw off the branch on which Western society is sitting. This is how it works. Because these ideologies are in the business of moral perfection, their governing idea cannot be challenged. They are virtue. Anyone who stands against them is basically a bad person, and so you can't challenge them. So the idea governs everything. The idea cannot be challenged. And so instead of starting with facts and evidence and working your way through those facts and evidence to reach a conclusion, and if you find that facts then emerge which contradict your conclusion, then hopefully you'll change your conclusion, um, that's how reason works, and that's how people reason if they basically believe in truth and are honest about how they reason. Instead of using evidence to reach a conclusion with an ideology, you start with the conclusion. You start with the idea. The idea cannot be challenged, and so the evidence has to be wrenched to fit the idea. Mm -hmm. And so since independent thought becomes impossible, therefore, such ideologies every one of them is basically inimical to reason. It repudiates reason. It repudiates independent thought. Now, I think it's hard to overstate the influence of these left-wing doctrines on our culture. They form the unchallengeable orthodoxy within academia from which they have managed, certainly in Britain, and I think this is happening here too, they have managed to shift the center of political gravity so that anyone who does not share these values is defined as extreme because the left believes that its own secular, materialistic, individualistic, and utilitarian values represent not a point of view, but virtue itself. The idea that some people may oppose these ideas because they are simply wrong cannot be entertained. The left cannot be wrong because it is virtuous. No decent people can therefore oppose it. Anyone who does oppose it is therefore bad. They must also be right-wingers. Since they're not of the left, they must be of the right. Can there be an alternative? No. They must be right-wingers, and as we all know, right-wingers are always bad people. And so if you oppose an ideology by saying, actually, that can't be right, that idea can't be right, because here are facts which contradict it, you are right-wing, you are bad, and you cannot be saying anything remotely resembling the truth, because there cannot be any truth that contradicts the idea. And therefore, you must be telling lies, you're a bad person, and heaven forbid anyone should believe you, so you have a label wrapped around your neck, whatever it is, right-wing, extreme right-wing, fascist, phobe, whatever it is, to tell people, don't go there, don't listen to that person. So there can be no dissent at all in this brave new world of progressivism. No dissent. None. Only one worldview is to be permitted. All others are to be suppressed or destroyed. It's what, in 1951, the thinker uh, J.L. Talmon called cultural totalitarianism. One of the main weapons used against dissidents by totalitarian regimes is demonization. Those who challenge the party line are represented as diabolical. This is because totalitarianism is, as the name suggests, totalizing. It is the embodiment of not just what is correct, but as I've said, of virtue itself, and anything that dissents from it is therefore evil. That's why climate change sceptics 
are not said just to be wrong, they're called Holocaust den they're, they're, they're called deniers as an analogy with Holocaust deniers. In similar fashion, those who supported the war in Iraq were demonized as neoconservative warmongers who, fan who fashioned a sinister conspiracy to take America to, and Britain to war on a lie to further the interests of Israel. This was because a number of neocons were Jews, and the term neocon thus become, became a synonym for the Zionist Jewish conspiracy, supposedly a uniquely powerful and secret cabal, which was said to have plotted for years to manipulate American foreign policy to serve Israel's purpose. Now, the key point to note is that the grip of ideology, ideologies like these, is specific to the intelligentsia. It correlates overwhelmingly with education and social class. In Britain, I find almost inexorably that the less educated a person, the more sensible and decent they are. The better educated the Brit, the better educated the Brit, the Brit, the more bigoted they're likely to be, the more likely their minds are to be tightly closed, and the more likely they are to be anti-Israel and anti-Jew. And that is because it is the educated classes who subscribe to ideas. That's what the educated classes do. They think about ideas. And these are ideas which purport to be the key to improving the world, but which, as I've tried to suggest, bear no relation whatsoever to reality. That's why intellectuals tend to be left-wing, because they are in the grip of these ideas about perfecting the world. When the left replaced religion with secular ideologies, it was therefore the intelligentsia that fell for them. So the educated classes are the most secular and the most anti-Jew. And I know you have this here because you have this dreadful problem on campus, as we do in Britain, of anti-Israel bigotry and hatred uh, running rampant in the universities. Which brings me to Edward Said, because it, he was of great importance in all this. Edward Said uh, was the professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia until his death in 2003, and he was one of the principal drivers of the anti-Israel hatred that is now coursing through our campuses. It, he had the most extraordinary grip on the intellectual mind. His book in 1978, Orientalism, shaped not just academic Middle Eastern studies, but the humanities more generally for more than three decades. In that book, Orientalism, Said accused Western academics studying the Orient of perpetuating negative racial stereotypes and anti-Arab and anti-Islamic prejudice to construct an entirely false impression of Islam and its civilization. Zionism, he taught, was an imperialist conspiracy created for the purpose, for the purpose of holding Islam at bay. More than anyone else, I would suggest, Edward Said made Israel hatred and the myth of Palestinian victimization academically mainstream and respectable. His influence in the universities has been enormous in promoting the cause of Palestine, demonizing Israel, and engendering a climate in which honest and truthful discussion of Islam has become all but impossible with one German Arabist, for example, observing some time ago that academics were now wearing, quote, a turban spiritually in their minds and practicing Islamic scholarship rather than scholarship about Islam. And it is, of course, university humanities graduates with their heads stuffed full with this propaganda and unable, as a result, to think straight about the Middle East, who have gone on to swing the whole intelligentsia behind this worldview, which has turned the universities, our universities, which should be the, uh, the center of free thinking, of free intellectual inquiry, of truth and of scholarship. It has turned the universities into the very crucible of unreason and the promulgation of hatred. And the media is stuffed full with such graduates. The media, whose anti-Israel, pro-third world groupthink has turned newspapers and broadcasting outlets, not to mention those sacred citadels of the liberal intelligentsia, the New York Review of Books and the London Review of Books, mm. into the propaganda arm of the jihad against Israel. But here's the thing. This monstrous deformation of thinking that I've been briefly explaining this evening has also driven the left into an unholy alliance with both neo-fascists and Islamo-fascists. Neo-fascists and white supremacists express their loathing for Islam and Muslims on the grounds that they loathe anyone who is basically not white. And yet, 
there is a significant number of these white supremacists and neo-fascists who make common cause with the Islamists against the Jews and against America, and therefore, inescapably, they make common cause with the left as well. So, the British National Party, neo-fascist party in Britain, has, in the past, advised its members to read The Guardian for information about, quote, the Zionist cabal around President George W. Bush. In 2003, the websites of groups such as the National Front, Combat 18, and the White Nationalist Party, all white supremacist neo-fascist groups, reproduced articles by the British left-wing journalist John Pilger and the Islamist group Hizbut Tahrir. The story of the Office of Special Plans, a supposed secret unit inside the Pentagon, which was said to have acted as a backdoor channel for Israel to manipulate American foreign policy through the neocons, appeared in The Guardian, the New Statesman and the Morning Star. Yet this theory had first appeared in Lyndon LaRouche's Executive Intelligence Review, a magazine devoted to anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. There is yet a further progressive member of this unholy alliance, the Green Environmental Movement, and I do hope I'm not treading on too many corns. <laughs> Under the banner of the anti-globalization backlash, ultra-leftists, neo-fascists, greens and anarchists have united in a rainbow coalition whose aim in smashing the established capitalist order is their only coherent characteristic. Anti-globalization protesters at the G20 meetings, for example, and this is back in 2009, smashed the windows of the Bank of England because they wanted to oust the bankers, abolish all borders, get rid of corrupt politicians and overhaul democracy. I'm sure you're all with them so far, as well as protesting, as well as protesting in favour of Palestine, carbon restrictions and actions against climate change. Of course, these things all go together, don't they? The French Jewish leader, Roger Kuchemann, has dubbed this an anti-Jewish, brown, green, red alliance among ultra-nationalists, greens and communist fellow travellers. Now, these unholy alliances are based on more than an opportunistic, revolutionary opportunism to bring down the West. The key point about all these movements is that they are utopian. Each, in its own way, wants to bring about the perfect society, create a new man and a new world. Each, therefore, thinks of itself as progressive. The supporters of each believe themselves to be warriors in the most noble of causes. The Greens believe they will save the planet. The left believe they will create the brotherhood of man. The fascists believe they will purge mankind of corruption. And the Islamists believe they will create the kingdom of God on earth. Now, you may be reeling at this rather strange collection of allies, but the idea that the left and the right come from different planets, the left come from Venus, the right from Mars, or is it the other way around? That is false. They both, left and right, have the same roots in the intellectual cross-currents that followed the 18th century Enlightenment. Both fascism and communism, with their roots in the French Revolution, were movements, both of them, hostile to reason. Just like communism, pre-1914 fascism expressed disgust for materialist capitalism. And if you want the very model of a left-wing Jew who incited hatred of the Jewish people, look no further than one Karl Marx, whose new man was to be created by society renouncing Judaism altogether. In 1844, Marx wrote in his essay on the Jewish question, what is the worldly religion of the Jew? Huckstering. What is his worldly God? Money. An organisation of society which would abolish the preconditions for huckstering and therefore the possibility of huckstering would make the Jew impossible. We recognise in Judaism, therefore, a general anti-social element of the present time. So this nexus between fascism and communism created early in the last century led to fascistic ideas which were deemed to be progressive a startling connection which continues today. 19th century social Darwinism, for example, led to eugenics, taken up with enthusiasm by both the Nazis and European progressives. And the environmental movement, with its core desire to call a halt to dehumanizing modernity and to return instead to an organic harmony with the natural world, was dear to the hearts of fascist and Nazi thinkers. Hitler would have been a green, or indeed a new ager devoted to paganism 
esoteric mysticism and organic vegetables. And this is also the connection to Islamism, not the organic vegetables, but anyway. This is also the connection to Islamism, whose founding ideologies drew freely upon both communism and fascism. That is because, just like these two secular Western movements, which also led to fanaticism, terror, and mass murder, fascism and communism both achieved these terrible effects, Islamism also repudiates modernity and reason in the interest of creating a perfect world. They're a perfect fit. And what the left and the Islamists also have in common is hostility to Judaism, to Israel, and the Jewish people. The genocidal hatred of Israel and the Jews that drives the Islamic Jihad against the West is not acknowledged or countered by the West because, I'm afraid to say, many of its most high-minded citizens share at least some of that prejudice. Both Western liberals and Islamists believe in utopias to which the Jews are an obstacle. The state of Israel is an obstacle to both the rule of Islam over the earth and the liberal goal of a world where there are no divisions based on religion or creed. The Jews are an obstacle, in the liberal thinking, to the unconstrained individualism of the Western sexual free-for-all and to the suppression of individual freedom by the Islamists. Both the liberal utopias of a world without prejudice, division, or war, and the Islamist utopia of a world without unbelievers, both of them are universalist ideologies. And the people who are always in the way of any universalizing ideology are the Jews. Who, therefore, can be surprised that post-national, post-religious, post-moral Britain is the home of the anti-Israel boycott, the hub of revived Christian theological anti-Semitism, and the principal money laundry for the Hamas. So these are the ways in which we have this unholy alliance between left and right, between progressives and their apparent antithesis, uh, between uh, uh, Western liberals, uh, between neo-fascists uh, and uh, Islamic uh, radicals, extremists and terrorists. And I think what preoccupies so many of us is what to do about the outcome that we can all see, which is this terrible hatred and unreason that we're all living through. Um, and it's a very hard thing to fight uh, because, uh, uh, by and large, the worldview of the left has become the kind of default position of the intelligentsia and it drives the culture before it. It's, uh, it's almost irrelevant that probably in every society the majority of ordinary people are not don't subscribe to these views, but everything that comes at them in the universities, in the media, on TV, in the newspapers, in books, in, in popular culture, everything kind of reflects this terrible default position, which is a position based on unreason uh, and hatred. So how to fight it is extremely difficult, and maybe we might talk a little bit about that. But it seems to me that I just want to conclude with this final thought, because um, the one thing that I've not uh, mentioned uh, is the characteristic of the, uh, uh, the, the I, I would say, almost the defining characteristic of contemporary liberal discourse, which is also its Achilles heel. Uh, all these ideologies I've been talking about, which uh, contemporary liberals or leftists uh, subscribe to, as I say, are all utopian. They're all, they all dress themselves in, in, in the clothes of, of unchallengeable virtue. The point is that, uh, and uh, this is certainly true from my own personal experience, the driving, uh, uh, the, 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 the core ism of the uh, Western progressive is actually narcissism. What the Western progressive cares about is his or her reputation. Um, they don't care about the fate of the dispossessed or the vulnerable. How could they? when they overlook the ill treatment of women in the Muslim world, the fact that the Palestinians are busy chucking each other off the tops of high buildings, uh, the fact that wherever it was, some uh, unfortunate gay man got thrown off the top of a building for the crime of homosexuality. Contemporary liberal discourse doesn't even mention these things. They don't care. 
They do not care about the fate of these people. What they care about is how they are seen to be caring about the fate of these people. And their reputation is everything to them. And so this is, their, in my view, their Achilles heel, because in my view, what they stand for is the negation of what they purport to stand for. Uh, they stand for unreason. They stand for hatred. They stand for bigotry. They stand for um, a profound, self-centered, not caringness about anybody but themselves. And so I think this is their Achilles heel. They need to be called out on this. Uh, you've probably heard the term delegitimize the delegitimizers, but that's precisely what we should be doing. Uh, we should realize that this is where they're vulnerable. They're not vulnerable if we say, but look at these facts, these following hundred essential facts you've got to know about the Middle East, whatever, won't go anywhere. What they actually will jump to is if they are trashed in the public mind as being stupid, uh, above all stupid, if they're being made to look ridiculous, if they are being shown, if they're academics, to be incompetent, poor scholars, relying on sort of voodoo facts. You can all, we can all think of ways in which we can, we can sort of lever this open. But that's the way you look at it, I think. That's, that's, that's the, the, the greatest weapon, because contemporary liberal discourse is about self-regard. And it's because it's about self-regard um, uh, that they won't connect to the reality of jihadism. I mean, fear has got a lot to do with it. You know, if they think, if you think you're about to be murdered, it does actually act as a bit of a dampener on free expression. Um, but nevertheless, I think there's something even deeper than fear. They don't allow themselves uh, to even think of these things because they, if if you if you allow yourself to think uh, that possibly the Muslim world is riven by Nazi-style anti-Semitism, if you allow yourself to think. Uh, that uh, actually the problem of uh, Islamic jihadism is rooted in religion, then you're allowing yourself to think that possibly ethnic minorities can be guilty of bad things and should be held responsible for those bad things, and that makes you a racist. And so it's that fear of how they are labelled by each other and how they label themselves that causes them to censor the way they think and to adopt these absurd positions. So I think that is, uh, although what I've said is, I'm sure, uh, certainly, I was going to say, I'm sure it's, it has shocked many of you, these connections that I've made, certainly shocked me uh, when I started to make them. But nevertheless, there is some hope in making these connections, because I think if one understands properly the kind of people that we're up against, um, and one starts to disentangle uh, what they purport to be from what they actually are, uh, then I think we can make some headway in truly making a better world. Thank you. Okay. Um, the, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, the the Six-Day War, I'm sure, was the great uh, 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 watershed. Um, uh, but I think that I would say... Um, uh, this, uh, as, as you say, there was some expression of this immediately afterwards, but it didn't really, I would suggest, didn't really get going until the 70s, but it was a sort of cumulative thing. Um, and as for ignoring uh, individual atrocities because of the greater good, um, uh, because it's an anti-imperialist, um, again, I don't disagree with you. Um, it's, it comes back to my original point. The governing idea drives all before it. And so you will turn yourself inside out and say 25 impossible things in order to justify the governing idea. So, you know, you're presented with the evidence of the gay person being thrown off the top of the building. You find some preposterous way of justifying it. Uh, but I don't disagree with you at all. But one can find a way through that by amplifying uh, in, the public, uh, in, the, in, in, in the public domain, amplifying the fact that this kind of person, this leftist person, this progressive person is supporting this. And you nail them to that mast in public, they don't like it. They really don't like it. Uh, do I think that because of the uh, growing number of atrocities in Europe, minds will change and people will be, begin to focus on reality more than they have been? Um, I think that's already happening, uh, but it's very, very, very slow. Um, uh, we've got to the point in Britain 
where people have come to the conclusion that what they previously thought wasn't right about the explanation for jihad. That's great. That's a tremendous advance. They think that doesn't quite hold up. Do they know what it is? What is the cause? No, they can't go there yet. Um, I'm afraid this sounds cynical and terrible, but it's going to take many more atrocities before that happens. With every atrocity, there's a bit more realism. But it depends, you know, this thing has gone on now for so long. The numbers are so great in Europe. The measures that would have to be taken are so draconian um, that it becomes ever more difficult with every month that passes to get a handle on it. What is happening in Europe, which is not necessarily terribly cheery, uh, is that on the mainland of Europe, because Britain is not actually part of Europe, you must realise it's a, a small bit that broke off and is floating somewhere in the North Sea. Um, uh, but in the main part of Europe, they're beginning to vote for extreme parties. Now, some of these parties are pretty obnoxious and some of them are less obnoxious. They're just nationalist parties, some of them. But they're basically all parties which are addressing the issues that the entire political class in Europe has ignored or made worse. So you have the beginning of a political expression of a fight back by ordinary people. In Britain, it's not the same. Britain doesn't do extremes. Um, uh, but there is a lot of anger uh, and a lot of unrest. Um, and what may happen, uh, who, who knows? Some people think, you know, Europe is over. They think the demographics of Muslim immigration and radicalism mean that, that Britain, that, that, that Europe is over. Uh, I don't take that view. I think it's uh, not sensible to predict the future. Um, and I don't think we can actually tell what's going to happen. What I do think is that there are two basic alternatives. Either a culture knows it's going over the edge of the cliff and says, well, you know, it was nice while it lasted, but cheerio. Um, you know, reason was great and uh, democracy is fine and, uh, you know, Western society had a lot, lot, lot going for it. But, you know, it's over now and I'm going to sort of shut my house door and um, look after my children, tend my plants and hope it all goes away. That's possible. It's possible. Black flag flies over Downing Street, Buckingham Palace, that sort of thing. It's possible. Society can go over the edge of a cliff. Possible. Or it can say, my God, there's a cliff and we're on it. And we're near the edge. Where it's at now, I would say it's saying, oh, it looks like there might be a cliff. That's where we're at. Will it go over? I don't know. Will it fight? It may well fight. We're seeing the beginnings of a fight. If it fights, it's going to be bloody, it's going to be horrible, it's going to be messy. There's going to be a lot of social disorder, a lot of firefighting by governments, panicky governments, a lot of more draconian stuff going on. Who's going to win? I don't know. Uh, are the Jews going to be in the middle of it? Yes. Is that going to be nice for them? No. More than that, one can't really say. I think that any remarks made by world leaders contribute to this general climate of unreason and denial. And the more important the world leader, uh, the more significant their contribution. Let's give a round of applause for Melanie again. Thank you.